looking at how place plays a role in upward mobility. And I chose this for two reasons. One is I increasingly believe this is one of the defining issues of our time. It is what I've spent most of my research looking at and is really what I focused on at HUD for the last three years. But the second is that this talk gives me the chance to focus on the way that research informs policy. So the office that I ran at HUD was the Office of Policy Development and Research, so it was the core mission of that office, and it is also a key component of the Wagner education. So I'll use one concrete example of a policy I worked on at HUD to give you an example both of this specific research and this policy area and the policy process itself. Okay, so while the U.S., the U.S. may think it has the best healthcare system in the country. We also think we have some of the best upward mobility in the world. Not so true. If you actually compare the United States to other similar countries, we actually rank very low in mobility by almost any of the measures that are commonly used in the research. Right? And the low upward mobility is particularly driven by stickiness at the bottom. So for example, children born in the United States in the lower quartile or fourth of incomes have about a 47% chance of moving up as adults. That compares to Canada, it's about 14 percentage points lower in Canada. So less than a third of the bottom quarter are gonna end up in the bottom at the top. That's a nice way to put it. The biggest issues of, uh, or some of the most troubling issues about the low mobility in the United States are the racial disparities. So for white children in the US, born in the bottom quarter of incomes, they have about a 32% chance of remaining there as adults, compared to black children born in the bottom quartile who have a 63% chance on remaining there as adults. So an African-American child born in this country at the bottom of the income distribution is twice as likely as a white child in the bottom of the income distribution to be there as an adult. This low economic mobility in the United States has been getting increased attention in the last four or five years in the context of increasing income inequality in the US. So income inequality in the US has been declining since the 1970s. We're now at a point that we haven't seen since 1928. Think of a world in which inequality is small. In a country where that's true, you may be less troubled by low upward mobility than in a country with large income inequality. And so whatever you're born into as a child is very, very different where you're likely to get as an adult. Big gaps. So that's the context where some recent research about what drives the low mobility in the US has been getting a lot of attention. You may have seen this map. This is one piece of work from Raj Chetty and other authors. It was in the New York Times. There are lots of other maps like this. This work's been getting a lot of attention in the last two years because it's at the nexus of place and mobility. I want to talk about one part of this study, which takes a HUD-funded and run experiment called Moving to Opportunity, or MTO. Some of you may have heard of it. You'll learn about it in class. The MTO was a randomized trial that took place in the late 1990s in which low-income families were given different types of vouchers. And the idea behind the experiment was if we could get very low-income families who receive housing assistance into better neighborhoods, did the families do better in the long run? What Chetty did is he took this research and he connected it to tax returns so that you could specifically look at whether the children who by random chance got access to better neighborhoods did better as adults compared to similar children who did not get that access. That was the experiment. And the answer is, do they do better? Yes, they do better. It, by looking at the kinds of measures that you would care about for upward mobility, the children who by chance got access to better neighborhoods, were more likely to go to college, more likely to go to better colleges, and they had higher earnings as adults than similar low-income children. So place matters in upward mobility independent of family income. It has its own influence. 
And we know in the United States we have large disparities across income and race in the places where families get to live, right? In the US, most research shows that actually the typical poor white family lives in a neighborhood with lower poverty, lower crime, and better schools than the typical non-poor African-American or Hispanic family. Huge variation. So if you combine that, that place matters, really matters for life chances and up mobility, and we've got huge disparities in place, that combination can explain one of the reasons why upper mobility is so low in the US. But the silver lining is it means it also gives you a mechanism through which we can improve upward mobility in the United States. We can use place to change the upward trajectory of low-income and minority kids in the country. And so HUD took this research, which was getting national attention, attention from Congress. President Obama was briefed on it. We took the research and the policy attention and appetite to focus on a number of policies that would move the needle on increasing access to better places. So let me talk about one of those. The specific policy that I got to work on in this space was focused on the following problem. HUD's best mechanism for helping very low-income assisted families get into better neighborhoods are household vouchers, right? Because you have choice and you can move. On the ability of getting to better neighborhoods, the policy's not doing that well. Nationally, about 20% of voucher families get into low-income neighborhoods, so neighborhoods with a poverty, I'm sorry, low-poverty neighborhoods, so 10% poverty or less. But in many metro areas, it's even worse. In Baltimore, 4% of families that get a voucher and have kids manage to get into low-income neighborhoods, low-poverty neighborhoods. That's really bad. So one of the factors that gets criticized and is a reason this may be happening is the way that HUD actually sets payment standards for the voucher. We use something called fair market rents, or FMRs, and they are set at the metro level so that households can afford about 40% of units in a metro area. But it's the same payment standard across the metro area. And in some metro areas, that FMR is not high enough to get into good neighborhoods. And all of those units, the 40% of units, are in very high poverty neighborhoods. So the idea that the HUD staff came up with, what if we actually have payment standards that vary at the neighborhood level just like rents do? You could set, you can use the ACS data, so now we have the American Community Survey, so we have data on a more regular basis at lower geography, to set rents at the zip code level. So that was the idea. Before you go from an idea to a national policy, you gather evidence. So HUD created a demonstration with the zip code level FMRs, payment standards, in five public housing agencies around the country, and even before that, through court-mandated order in Dallas. And the evidence from Dallas, which has been doing this the longest, is that voucher households are moving to lower poverty, lower crime neighborhoods at about the same cost, average cost. So we're serving the same number of households. That evidence then went into the policy design process. The rulemaking and, and policy design process in a federal agency has many steps. First step, you make an announcement to the public so that all stakeholders can engage and give you their ideas. From those ideas, a, a rule was actually designed, went through a final rulemaking process that was finalized on November 16th, which means it was implemented formally on January 17th. It was a two-year process to go from the, the, the comments and it is now the new policy in a collection of areas where vouchers are most concentrated. So I want to end with just a couple of reflections on thinking about the connection between research and policy and why we focused on this for the last two years. The first is the change that we wanted to use is rulemaking. So if you're at the end of a Democratic administration with a Republican-held Congress and Senate, you're focusing on rulemaking, not legislation. That does not mean Congress is not involved with rulemaking. Rulemaking is hard. When you do not have an addition in the budget and you make a change, somebody perceives or is losing. Fixed budget, changing something, somebody loses. Anybody who's gonna lose knows they're gonna lose. They're identifiable. You know what the current funding streams are. They go through the public comment period with you. They have an elected official that they are gonna be in touch with. Elected officials in Congress are gonna be reaching out to the federal agency. Those who are better off may not even be identifiable. 
They don't show up in the public comment period in the same way. So even with the rule that had lots of support, it is a long and hard process. What helps? I want to point out two things that help. You need champions. You need champions external to the federal agency who are willing to engage in the public comment period, and you need champions inside the building. Every federal agency has way too many priorities to get done, not enough staff, not enough money. Even without opposition, things won't get done unless somebody is continuously championing that of the five things that you want to get done and the two that are left, I want to get my two on there. So you need multiple champions within the building. The career staff who created the idea were on my team. I was their champion. They convinced the former Secretary of HUD, Sean Donovan, that this was a great idea. He became the champion. He convinced the incoming and then Secretary Julian Castro that it was a good idea. Multiple champions moving it forward every step. And the second was the research. We had the research showing the effects in Dallas. This was absolutely critical. Every time we got to that list of five, I could point to that research and say, but we know it works. We know that this is going to make something better, and we could say that to OMB and the White House for making sure it got through the process. But the other piece of research was the Chetty research. Research that you can leverage from outside your organization in a policy window that opens up is critical for being able to have impact. And so we pride ourselves here at Wagner on training public servants who can be in organizations who can translate that research so that you can grab that policy moment to actually have an impact. So I'm going to end there. Thank you for coming, and I get to hope I get to talk to you later.